We're Trent and Allie, and we live in a van and have been traveling through Central and South America for the past year. In order to travel through all of these different countries, you have to cross a ton of international borders. And every border is a little bit different. It's by far the hardest part of overlanding or traveling by vehicle. So today we wanted to break down every step that you need to know if you want to cross international borders by vehicle. So the Peru-Chilean border is actually pretty intense because they have a very, very strong control on fruits and vegetables and all types of food and produce. So hopefully we're going to be able to film a lot of this to show you guys what we have to go through, but I think there's going to be a pretty intense inspection. They're going to make us throw away or they're going to confiscate any fruits and vegetables and things that we have. This is a really good border for us to film for you guys. So pretty much every country's border that you cross is going to have the same type of outline or the same type of procedures. Oh man, it's always a little nerve wracking. Gotta like gear up for a border crossing, you know? You wanna be polite, respectful, friendly, but you wanna be prepared to stand your ground and stand up for yourselves and put your war face on, you know? So the first detail that we're gonna go over is humans. So when you drive up to a border, you drive up to your exit country's border. You do a whole exit process with them, and part of that includes getting stamped out of that country. Then, generally, you drive another couple hundred yards, it's not very far, to the entrance border of the other country you are entering. And that's where you get another stamp to get stamped into that country. So in that, like, one or two hundred yards of no man's land, you're not stamped in anywhere. You're yeah, so just floating in the ether. <laughs> so don't get lost there. <laughs> We're officially stamped out of Peru, which is the first step in every border crossing, and now we have to get in line to enter Chile. The next part is the vehicle process. This can be a little bit more complicated, but if you just have some patience, it'll all work out in the end. Basically, you need to have some very specific documents with you in order to get a temporary import registration from the country you are entering, which allows you to drive legally for a temporary amount of time in that country. For sure you need your original title and registration for your vehicle. Also to clarify, as far as insurance goes, a lot of people think that they're going to buy a insurance policy that's going to cover them in all of these countries that they go to. That doesn't really exist. Usually what has to happen is as soon as you cross the border, you have to go and buy insurance in that country and you're required to have it while you're there or for the extent of your stay. And if you get pulled over and you don't have this, you can get into a lot of trouble. I think the most we've spent is like $50 for like a couple months of insurance on the van. So it's not expensive, but it is required. And usually there's places at the border where you can obtain it. Now it gets a little bit more complicated if you have a secondary vehicle, especially if your secondary vehicle is also registered in a totally different country than your primary vehicle. We're probably the most complicated people to ever <laughs> cross borders because we have a van from the States, a motorcycle from Mexico, and a dog. You're probably wondering how that happened, and if you've watched our travels thus far, once we got into Mexico in our van, we realized these roads are really small, we can't make some of the corners in a lot of the downtown historic zones, so we ended up buying a motorcycle in Mexico. This has been a lifesaver yeah. and a nightmare. Yeah. It's a huge pain in the butt when we have to cross borders, however, the van is huge, and in a lot of places, it's really convenient to be able to park it, take the motorcycle to explore, bring the motorcycle back to the van, everything's good, we don't have to worry about getting sideswiped. It's been a lifesaver and a nightmare. You have all your paperwork for your primary vehicle, you need the exact same paperwork for your secondary vehicle if you have one. So the original title as well as the original registration. We have our motorcycle documented, our vehicle documented. They still don't know about Frank and we've gotta go through the inspection for all the fruits and vegetables. We are on our way. At least it's a beautiful day. Everything is outside and it's so windy, but at least it's not raining. It's not super hot. Things are looking good. Let's get this border crossing underway. So the next step is a pet. A lot of people that travel by vehicle, in a van, in an RV, in an overlanding vehicle, in a Jeep, whatever you're traveling in, a lot of people bring a dog with them. Or Some a cat. people bring a cat yeah. or a rabbit Snakes, or whatever. whatever and anything that you bring with you is considered a pet. And this creates a pretty mediocre sized hurdle at every single border. Pretty much every country is going to require you to have verified health information from a vet from the country that you are departing from. And then once you get to this country, there's going to be a federal office 
that will probably be incognito or hidden somewhere that you need to find and you need to go talk to them, show them all your verified paperwork and you need to get import paperwork for your dog. It would be really, really easy if they just let dogs get passports, but they don't let dogs get passports. So this needs to happen at every single border. And usually every vet is gonna charge you usually like 20 to $100. So this gets expensive. It's a huge pain in the butt, but in Panama, we didn't actually do the export paperwork. We got on an airplane, we flew to Colombia, and as soon as we landed in Colombia, there was a huge disaster. They were trying to quarantine our dog. They were gonna take him for 14 days. We ended up working out a deal where we could do an in-house quarantine and keep him, but it's just a huge level of stress that you really don't need to be under if you just do the proper paperwork. So export paperwork, import paperwork for your dog at every border is imperative. Traveling with a pet is the most expensive, most cumbersome, most complicated part of overlanding. Borders are difficult, but if you have a pet, it just is way longer and way harder, but it's doable. You just have to have a little patience. Like I said, have your paperwork in order and it's all possible. So right now we're actually at a place called Sanasa. Sanasa is kind of like the USDA in the United States. It's basically an organization that controls animals and different things crossing across the border. You would think you can just cross across the border with your dog, but first you have to go to a vet. Yesterday we went to the vet. They verified that he has all of his vaccinations, that he's healthy, how much he weighs, what race he is, how old he is. We got all that information yesterday. Now we need to go to this government office, get them to check off on all the information, just give us another piece of paper so that when we get to the border, they don't turn us around. Now that we got our federal certification from Peru, we can head to the border and then all we have to do is everything else. Some countries, you walk into one building, they have everything lined up. You're like a, a sheep or a cow that's getting like pushed through a corral and you just get to do everything in order. It's super easy. Yeah. Some countries you show up and you're just in like a little miniature border city and all the buildings look the same and nobody's wearing a, an official shirt, nothing looks normal. It's up to you to find the place for visas, which is immigration, the place for vehicles to get your temporary import permit. You gotta make sure that they know you have two vehicles and then you've gotta hunt down Sanasa or the Wildlife and Game Association or whatever it is in whatever country that you're going to. Sometimes they're in completely different parts of the town. Sometimes they're right next to each other, but without fail, you need to go to all these different buildings and it's your responsibility. There's nobody there that says, did you have a dog or do you have a dog? Do you have a second vehicle? You need to make sure that you know everything you need. And there's no signs. Yeah, there's, there's no never signs. signs. There's a couple different places that you can look for guidance yes. with these things. Okay, the first is one that we don't necessarily recommend, but they exist at a lot of different borders. They're called helpers or tramitadores. Basically, they are people working for tips alone that are just standing around so excited to help guide you through the process. When some of these borders are a little bit more chaotic and there's multiple buildings spread all over the place, these guys seem like they would be of great service to you. And they might be if you solidify a price with them ahead of time. We've had a pretty bad experience with some tramitadoras in Guatemala. They're usually wearing uh, one colored collar shirts. They look just like the officials at the border. They usually have name tags that have their picture. They look super official. They'll have a clipboard. Sometimes they help you and they just are looking for a tip. We got almost scammed out of like $300 because we were just trusting and listening to this person. So from that point forward, we decided no matter how long it takes, no matter how stressful it is, we will just figure it out. We don't wanna to have to worry about putting our trust in somebody that we don't know that doesn't work for the country that's just helping. So. This is a decision you're gonna to have to make on your own. So to get past this obstacle of whether you feel comfortable trusting this person, what we recommend is going up to offices and asking the people that are actually working inside the buildings where you need to go and if you're in the right place. And if you do this with a smile on your face, show a lot of respect and hopefully try out a couple phrases in Spanish or speak as much Spanish or whatever language they speak in the country you're entering, <laughs> you will receive much better quality of service in return. 
It's pretty difficult when you're at these borders because things are in Spanish and Ali speaks pretty good Spanish. I speak a little bit of Spanish, but sometimes the verbiage or the way they describe what they want doesn't really translate exactly. So it's confusing and you have to wait until you get up to the counter and then ask them what they want there. Absolutely. It's all about respect. We show a lot of respect wherever we go. And like I said, everything that you do in a border process needs to be basically smothered with patience. Mm -hmm. You have to be, you have to have no expectation. If you think, oh, we're going to roll up to this border and it's only going to be four hours. Like don't even think only four hours because we've had borders that took like five and six hours. We've so also had borders that took 20 minutes. Expect it to take all day. That's why we also recommend showing up super early, not only to avoid lines that start to accumulate throughout the course of the day, but also because border towns are generally known for not being super safe. And once you leave a border town, you don't want to sleep in that area. You want to drive a ways to somewhere safe and you don't want to drive at night. So probably the most useful resource or the best place to go for guidance that we have found is iOverlander. iOverlander is a free app that's basically crowdsourced. It's been going for probably over 10 years. Yeah. It has so much information of people that have done the exact same thing we're doing, have probably done the exact same thing you're going to do. And a lot of borders, there's people that create posts. They put so much time into it. Basically this whole video tailored to each border that you go to. So yeah. as soon as you show up at Guatemala's border, they'll tell you which building to go to, who to talk to, I mean, where everything is just like when we crossed into Chile just barely in order to get our application to cross the border you had to go into the cafeteria that looked like the employee break room <laughs> and it's like on the third story like you would just never know to go there unless you figure it out and it's kind of hard to just assume or start looking around so looking on iOverlander gave us the correct directions on where to go and it made things much more streamlined as it has at quite a few borders for us. There's also a Facebook group called the Pan American Travelers Association. This is great for questions and advice along the way. They don't have step-by-step -step directions for each border or, or safe places to stay in each town like iOverlander does, but it's also a great resource if you have questions throughout your journey. Hola. Hola, buenas, ¿qué tal? Ah, española. Un poquito, estamos practicando. Estamos practicando, hola. Sí. ¿De dónde son? De los Estados Unidos. Sí, gringos. Sí. Americanos. Estamos sí, manejando gringos. por Argentina. Sí, Hicimos gringo. Gringolandia. Gringolandia, sí. Sí, sí. ¿Hicieron toda la documentación? Pienso que sí. Piensa que sí. Habla bien. Ah, no, pero gracias. Sí, speak Spanish. Sí. Name? Frank. 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 Como Francisco. Francisco. Frank. Frank, Frank Sinatra. Frank Sinatra. Frank Sinatra. Sí. Frank Sinatra. Sí. Salt Lake. Salt Lake City. Ahí viven. Uh, Utah. Utah. Sí, sí. Cerca de California. Sí. ¿Llevan comida? Sí. ¿Qué? ¿Qué tipo de comida? Ah, ah sí, sí. Ajo. Sí. Ribdo. No pasa. Okay. No, 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 no pasa. Sí, no pasa. Cerré la pista porque estoy... Well, that was crazy. It looks like uh, they took wow. some carrots, some garlic, some tomatoes, and some eggs. And we knew they were going to take some stuff, but there's some things they didn't find. <laughs> Vamos por Chile! Woo! Traveling through these countries has given us such a different perspective compared to what you see flying into one of these countries or even traveling by backpack when you're just on a bus or however you're going about traveling. Traveling overlanding is very, very different. You really get to experience the culture. You get to see the country from top to bottom. It's basically unmatched as far as traveling goes. And if you guys are watching this video because you're about to start overlanding, you're about to start traveling through Central or South America, you're gonna love it. We're it's gonna be awesome. We are super excited for you. <laughs> no necesitamos más? No. Okay. Bueno. Gracias. Gracias. We did it. We did it. That was not that long. That probably took uh, maybe two hours? two hours at the most. And now we're in Chile, baby. Woo! And we're right on the beach. Let's get to our first destination, Arica.
just like that, we made it to the beach. We are in Chile. Everything today went really smooth. We hope you guys found this video informative. Maybe you learned something. Maybe it gave you some tips for when you're crossing borders in a Latin American country or borders, period, in your van. And now we're actually gonna make some food and kick back, maybe have a beer, watch the sunset, and enjoy our time in a new country. So hopefully you guys enjoyed coming along on this adventure today. Make sure to give this video a like, subscribe to our channel if you haven't already so you can follow along with our journeys through South America, and we'll see you guys on the next one. Adios.